Let's continue our study in Chapter 7 by taking a look at Lagrange's theorem and its consequences. Lagrange's theorem tells us that if G is a finite group and H is a subgroup of G, then the order of H divides the order of G. So before we look at the second part of that, what we're saying is, let's say G has order 30. What it tells us is that if we have a subgroup H, the subgroup must be a divisor of 30. So a subgroup of one or two or three or five or six or 10 or 15 or 30. What it doesn't tell us is that you're going to have a subgroup of that order. It just says these are the possibilities for the orders of the subgroups. So that's very important to understand the difference. We're not going to have one of each like we talked about before um, with the orders of elements. So let's see um, the second part of Lagrange's theorem that says the number of distinct left or right cosets of H in G is actually the quotient G, the order of G divided by the order of H. So for instance, let's look back at this example that we looked at in our last video. We found all of the right cosets of H where H was the uh, subgroup 1 and 11 in U30. And so in this case, the order of H is 2 and the order of G or of U30 is 8 because there are 8 elements in the set. Now, when we went through and did all of the calculations where we took, again, the right cosets, so we took 1 times h and we took 7 times i'm sorry right cosets <laughs> h times 1 and h times 7 and h times 11 and h times 13 and we took it times each of these elements and we took those elements on the right hand side and what we found was that obviously you would get a product for all um, eight of those elements but there were only four distinct cosets and that's what Lagrange's theorem can tell us is how many there are so what they're saying is that the index which is just a fancy term for the number of distinct left or right cosets can be found by the order of g divided by the order of h in this case the order of g is 8 the order of h is 2 it tells us there's going to be four distinct cosets now if you'll recall back to our last video we found those four distinct cosets to be H and to be H7 and to be H13 and to be H19. Now, keep in mind, as I said before, when I took H times 1, that gave me 1 and 11, and when I take h times 11 that gave me 11 and 1 those are not distinct cosets so what we do is we're saying that that's just that one distinct coset so are there four yes there are these are the four that we found previously there are a few consequences of lagrange's theorem which are just corollaries essentially of lagrange's theorem the first says in a finite group, the order of each element divides the order of the group. This should be pretty straightforward, but I have given you an example with U8. Now U8 is not a cyclic group. Uh, as we can see, we don't have any generators, but the order of one is one. The order of three is two. So the order of, sorry, the order of three is the same as the order of the cyclic subgroup generated by three, which is two. And this one, the order of five is two. And this one, the order of seven is two. And notice each of these divides the order of the group, which is four. So one divides four, two divides four, and so forth. The next is a group of prime order is cyclic. And that makes sense because the only subgroups would be the generators because obviously we don't have any factors of a prime. And so any um, subgroup would be a generator. And then we have a to the g is equal to e. Now this one's pretty interesting because 
if we know the order of the group, we know how we can always get back to the identity. So for instance, let's just use U8 since we already have U8 for us up here. Now, without even knowing anything about the orders of these elements, I know that the order of U8 is equal to four. So I know that no matter what, if I take, say, three to the fourth, I'm gonna get back to the identity. And if I take one to the fourth, I'm gonna get back to the identity. And if I take five to the fourth, I'm going to get back to the identity, and seven to the fourth, back to the identity. Now, is that true in this case? Well, let's take a look. One just generates one. So that's going to give me one, and then one, and then one, and then one. Obviously, I'm back at the identity of one. For three to the fourth, I'm going to get three, then I'm gonna get the identity, then I'm gonna get three, and then I'm gonna get the identity, because three squared is nine, so that's back to the identity of one. And then three to the third is 27, which is three mod eight, and then three to the fourth is 81. And again, I can see that here as well. So again, here, I'm going to get five, and then one, and then five, and then one, and here I'm going to get seven, and then one, and then seven, and then one. And again, that goes back to the fact that the order of the element divides the order of the group. Another consequence of Lagrange's theorem is Fermat's little theorem. So for every integer a and every prime p such that p does not divide a, a to the p mod p is equal to a mod p. That's not as useful as the way that we normally see it written, which is that a to the p minus one is congruent to 1 mod p. So here's how this can be helpful for us. Let's say I want to compute 5 to the 15th mod 7. Well, based on Fermat's little theorem, I know that 5 to the p minus 1, or 5 to the 6th, is going to be congruent to 1 mod 7. So that's what Fermat's little theorem tells us. So how is that going to help me to compute 15, 5 to the 15th mod 7? Well, 5 to the 15th is equal to 5 to the 6th times 5 to the 6th, which is 12, times 5 squared times 5 to the 1st. Well, that tells me that 5 to the 6th is 1 mod 7. And 5 to the 6th is 1, mod 7. And 5 squared is 25, mod 7, that is 4. And then, of course, 5 to the 1st is 5. So 1 times 1 times 4 times 5 is 20. And 20, oops, this is mod 7. And 20 mod 7 is 6, mod 7. Same thing for 7 to the 13th mod 11. This Fermat's little theorem tells me that 7 to the 10th is congruent to 1 mod 11. So how is that going to help me? If I have 7 to the 13th, that's the same as 7 to the 10th times 7 squared times 7. So 7 to the 10th is congruent to 1 mod 11, and then 7 squared is 49, which is 5 mod 11, and then 7. So again, this is mod 11. And then 1 times 5 times 7 is 35 mod 11. That is 2 mod 11. Let's do one last practice to make sure we understand Lagrange's theorem and how it can be used. Suppose that the order of A is 20. How many right cosets of the cyclic subgroup generated by A to the fifth in the cyclic subgroup generated by A are there and what are they? So again, the first thing I need to do is think about A to the fifth. What is the order of the cyclic subgroup generated by a to the fifth. Well, first let's find the elements. So a to the fifth would give me a to the fifth, would give me a to the 10th, would give me a to the 15th, 
and would give me a to the 20th, which is actually the identity. So that means the order of the cyclic subgroup generated by A divided by the order of the cyclic subgroup generated by A to the fifth is going to give me the number of right cosets. Well, the order of A is 20, and the order of A to the fifth we just determined is four because there are four elements in that set. So how many right cosets are there? There are five right cosets. What are the right cosets? Well, the first one is just a to the fifth. Then we have to think about how am I going to generate all of the other values? So if we think about this set, it's e and then a and then a squared and a to the third and so on until we get to a to the 19th, a to the 20th, which is actually the identity. So this is the set that I'm trying to generate. So how many right cosets? There are five right cosets. Remember that the cosets are going to partition that. So I need to partition all of those values. So what if I take a to the fifth, and we're, again, we're looking at right cosets, so times a. Well, what's that going to give me? That's going to give me a to the fifth times a, which is a to the sixth, a to the tenth times a, which is a to the eleventh, a to the 15th times a, which is a to the 16th, and e times a, or the identity times a, which is a. Okay, so that's definitely one of them. And then what if I do the same thing with a squared? Well, that's going to give me a to the 7th, a to the 12th, a to the 17th, a squared. Great, let's continue. What if I take a to the 5th, times a to the third. Well, that's going to give me a to the eighth, a to the thirteenth, a to the eighteenth, a to the third. Okay, let's do a to the fifth times a to the fourth. That's going to give me a to the ninth, a to the fourteenth, a to the nineteenth, and a to the fourth. Now, that's five cosets. Here are the five cosets, which could also obviously just be written like this. Those are the five right cosets. And as we can see, we have all of the values that would have been in the original set. So we have partitioned the original set. For our last practice, let's talk about how we would prove with Lagrange's theorem. So let G be a group with the order of G equal P times Q, where P and Q are distinct primes. Prove that every proper subgroup of G is cyclic. So I'm just going to talk through this. I'm actually not going to write anything down uh, because it would be boring to just watch me write things down. So let's talk about how we could do this. We know by Lagrange's theorem, the only possible orders of the proper subgroups of G have to be P or Q. Why do we know that? That's by Lagrange's theorem. And Lagrange's theorem also tells us that a group of prime order is cyclic. Well, we already know that this is a prime and therefore its order is cyclic. And this is a prime and therefore its order is cyclic. And therefore, we know that every proper subgroup of G must be cyclic. Now, keep in mind that this is saying proper subgroup, so we also could have a subgroup of order PQ, but that wouldn't be a proper subgroup because it would be generating the entire set. Coming up next, we're going to take a look at external direct products.